tired of waiting for colonization? Does the Earth seem way too boring with all its problems and mosquitoes? Well, have no fear. It's time to take matters into your own hands and build your own planet. But before you start reaching for the cosmic glue and glitter, there are a few things you'll need to consider. Let's start our ultimate DIY project. First of all, we need to choose a location. Every planet has to orbit a star, right? In a cosmic buffet, every star has its own unique flavor. To keep things organized, astronomers use the so-called stellar classification system. The massive stars are the divas of the cosmos. They're huge, bright, and are always stealing the spotlight. But it's not all sunshine and rainbows. They have a short lifespan, burning out super fast, like a candle. They also have huge gravity, so be careful that your planet doesn't get sucked in. The dwarf stars, on the other hand, may be small, but they make up for it with their stamina. They can burn for trillions of years, which means that their planets have plenty of time to develop life. Super hot stars are blue or white ones, while the cold stars are usually red or orange. Yeah, seems like it should be the other way around, but we're not the ones making the rules. So what do we choose? Well, the planets around the blue and white stars could be scorched and fried, like a crispy chicken nugget. On the other hand, with cool red stars, our planet may turn into an ice ball. If that's your preference, then sure. But you can always pick a nice middle ground, a yellow star like our sun, for example. Not too cold, not too hot, but just right. Now that you've picked the star, Let's start building the planet. The heart of the planet is its core. The core creates a magnetic field, an invisible force that protects a planet from harsh cosmic rays and charged particles. If it weren't for this field, the planet would be fried by the star's radiation, like a well-done burger. But the magnetic field isn't always a force for good. On some planets, like Jupiter, it's so strong that it creates super intense radiation belts and some crazy weather. If you were hoping to use a compass to find your way around on such a planet, forget it. The magnetic field would have the needle spinning like a breakdancer on caffeine. So if you pick a small light core, the planet will have less protection from solar radiation, like tanning without sunscreen. On the other hand, larger cores can generate more heat which can lead to more volcanic activity and earthquakes. The best option is a medium-sized core made mostly of iron and nickel. Enough to keep the bad things away, but not too strong to turn a planet into a cosmic hot potato. Once the heart is in place, we can move on to the next step. Hogars, uh, sorry, planets, are like onions. They have layers. Most planets have three main layers, the core, the crust, and the mantle. The core is the filling, as we've already discussed. The mantle is like a hot and gooey layer of caramel between the crust and the core. And the crust is like a thin layer of icing on a planetary cake, covering its surface. But not all planets are built the same way. Because of that, we have tons of options. First up, we have the gas giants, the big boys of the universe. In our solar system, it's Jupiter and Saturn. They don't have a crust at all. They're basically huge balls of gas, like hydrogen and helium, hence the name. Next, we have the ice giants, like Uranus and Neptune. They're like younger, cooler siblings of gas giants. These planets don't really have a solid surface, but it's not pure gas either. They're made mostly of water, ammonia, and methane ice. There are also ocean worlds. And no, they aren't made of pure water. They do have some kind of solid surface, but it's located so deep, and the ocean on their surface is so huge that it kind of does look like a giant water drop. Finally, we have terrestrial planets, like the Earth. They're made mostly of rock and metal. These planets have a surface to stand on and usually come with a cool mineral collection. And let's not forget about the dwarf planets, the small but mighty. 
Pluto is probably the most famous one, but there are others in our solar system. Eris, Ceres, Haumea, and so on. They're the scrappy underdogs of the planetary world, always trying to prove their worth, but never making it to full-fledged planets. Which type do you like the most? Gas giants are probably the coolest ones with their enormous sizes, crazy winds, and scary lightning. We also need to create an atmosphere. It's the outer layer of a planet that plays a huge role in its climate and weather. It's also the planet's ultimate protector. Did you know that 90 to 95% of meteors burn up in the Earth's atmosphere? Imagine what would happen if they didn't. Dense and hazy atmospheres, the ones you'll find on places like Venus, have thick layers of carbon dioxide and sulfuric acid. In other words, it's not a planet, but an oven. It's so hot that you could cook a pizza on its surface in no time and get cooked yourself. Next, we have thin and wispy atmospheres, like on Mars. The thin layer of carbon dioxide makes its surface pressure about 1%, that of Earth's. On planets like these, you could fly like a superhero if you had a good enough jetpack. Then we have mixed atmospheres, like the one on Earth. The layers of nitrogen, oxygen, and other gases create the perfect conditions for life as we know it. It's also where we get to enjoy sunny days, rainbows, and of course, water. And last but not least, exotic atmospheres. You'll find them on planets like Neptune, where the layers of hydrogen, helium, and methane create a blue-colored world that looks like a giant marble. They're super weird and unusual, so just perfect for creative planet builders. Almost done. The final question is, would you like your planet to have life on it? In that case, there are some things you should consider. For example, it should be located in the habitable zone. This is the sweet spot around a star where conditions are just right for liquid water to exist on the surface. Make sure your planet isn't too close or too far from its star. And don't forget about the temperatures. For example, you'll want a good amount of oxygen for a planet to be nice and warm, but not too much that everything spontaneously combusts. Of course, we need some water, but not too much, and a stable climate. You don't want your planet to be going through extreme swings in temperature or moisture. That's a recipe for extinction, not evolution. Oh, and the orbit should be stable so that there are no major astronomical events that could throw things off. As you can see, this type of planet is very picky. No wonder it's so hard to find extraterrestrial life. Anyway, now that we've finished messing around in the planet creation editor, how do we even build it? Well, how about terraforming? It's when we deliberately alter a planet's atmosphere, temperature, and other conditions to make it habitable for humans and other Earth-based life forms. For example, we could release greenhouse gases on Mars to warm up the planet and create a thicker atmosphere. But this method is more like polishing a monstrosity that was given to you by a character randomizer. What about building from scratch? That's something straight out of sci-fi. But maybe in the future, we could do that, using large-scale 3D printing for nanotechnology. We could create the basic structure and then add all the necessary conditions for life to exist. Of course, all this is still purely theoretical. But while creating a planet artificially is still a long way off, there are many creative ideas and concepts being explored by scientists and sci-fi writers. Who knows what the future might hold for the possibility of creating new worlds. Here on our good old planet Earth, water is literally everywhere. Not only in the oceans and seas, but also in the atmosphere, in the ground, and even in ourselves. It covers as much as 71% of the surface of our planet. Looks like our planet should have been called water and not Earth. But what would happen if water and land were distributed equally? What if half of the planet became land and the other half was water? Well, let's find out. First of all, let's discuss what we mean by equally. Despite all the things mentioned earlier, there's actually not so much water on our planet. 
Yeah, if you collected it all in one giant drop, it'd be slightly larger than the United States in size. And all this amount of water would only be 0.02% of the total mass of Earth. So, it turns out that all these horrifying unexplored ocean depths are basically nothing. And now, just imagine if we changed the composition of our planet by leveling the volume of water and land. What would happen then? Then, we'd get a very creepy ocean planet. The planet would look like one boundless ocean. It'd be very unlikely that you'd find even a couple of small islands on it. And if you did find them, they'd probably be the tops of huge underwater mountains. This world would be practically uninhabitable. If you were on its surface, you wouldn't be able to see the sun or anything else in the sky. You wouldn't know what time of day it is or where exactly you are. All because of the incredibly thick fog and clouds. This kind of weather would be permanent on such a planet. Moreover, you wouldn't even understand where the fog ends and the water begins. All because the humidity would be that high. But could there still be life? Well, maybe inside the ocean itself? Unfortunately, this is also quite unlikely. You see, to get to the bottom of this ocean, you'd have to swim vertically down, not for several hours, but for several days. And even after such a journey, you wouldn't see the bottom yet. The ocean wouldn't be bottomless, of course, but the seabed would consist mainly of very hard, impenetrable ice. But not the kind of ice we're used to. This ice would be exotic. There are different types of it called ice 5, ice 6, and so on. Usually, these types of ice aren't as cold as regular ice and may not melt even at high temperatures. And there would be almost no algae or anything like that. So fish would simply have nothing to eat. That's why if life appeared on such a planet, it would be a miracle. This life would have to withstand a pressure of more than 20,000 Earth atmospheres. Even the most horrifying monsters from the Mariana Trench would be nothing in comparison to the creatures you'd find on this ocean planet. But could we humans live there? Well, theoretically, yes, but it would be extremely hard. We could create something like giant underwater stations, but we would still have thousands of problems where to get food and other resources, how to repair stuff, and so on. So it would be far from the best option. Okay, now we know that an ocean planet doesn't sound too endearing. What about another option? What would happen if the surface of the Earth was 50% water and 50% land? For this to happen, we'd need to reduce the current amount of water from 71 to 50%. In this case, the sea level would drop by about 2 miles and a quarter of our planet would become dry land. Although it doesn't sound like much, the consequences would be disastrous. Right now, there are five interconnected oceans on Earth – Atlantic, Indian, Pacific, Southern, and Arctic. But if we lowered the sea level, all these oceans would simply disappear. They'd turn into separate closed reservoirs and seas. On the contrary, all the continents would merge into one giant landmass almost as if we swapped the land and water. At first, it would seem pretty cool. Now, you could literally walk around the world. However, the amount of land you'd have to travel would also increase. Every continent on the planet would grow in size. All this new territory would be approximately equal to the current area of Asia, Europe, Africa, and North America combined. Well, that would be a huge mass of unused space. But what would we find on these new territories? Most of them would be pretty flat. But in places where there used to be deep oceans, you would see vast corridors and steep crevices. Now, here's another cool thing. Most of the sunken cities would return to the surface. And no, unfortunately, we wouldn't find Atlantis among them. But there would still be a lot of other cool places. For example, the ancient Roman city of Baia, which, according to legends, was basically a paradise on Earth with all its luxurious villas and gardens. Or Heraklion, the city that went under the sea thousands of years ago and was considered a myth for a long time. So yeah, we could organize tours to these ancient places. But of course, not everything would be fun and games in such a world. Due to a severe loss of water, ocean currents would be disrupted and this would lead to very serious climate problems. The ocean absorbs the heat radiated by the sun. 
thanks to the currents, this heat is distributed all over Earth, which creates a stable and pleasant climate. But if these currents were disrupted, then the temperatures on Earth would become more extreme. It would get much hotter near the equator and even colder around the North and South Poles. So yeah, unfortunately, the Antarctic ice wouldn't save us. It would be quite the opposite. The regions around the North and South Poles would completely dry out, basically turning into dry, cold deserts. In addition to heat, water also absorbs carbon dioxide from the air. And since the oceans wouldn't be able to absorb it, this gas would begin to accumulate in the atmosphere. This poisonous excess would cover the entire planet. The average temperatures would increase, and the whole planet would start to dry out slowly. Massive forest fires would break out, and so on. Hmm, sound familiar? Now, to make matters worse, there would be nothing to extinguish these fires, because, you know, rains can't form from nothing. So yeah, the precipitation levels would fall, and this would lead to dangerous droughts. We'd get a bunch of new deserts on all the continents. Despite getting all those new territories, it's unlikely that we could somehow build new cities and towns there. Many of these territories would be uninhabitable. Not only because many forests and plants would disappear, but also because most animals would migrate to more pleasant places. As a result, we would have great difficulty finding any food at all. So, all life on our planet, plants, animals, and people, would have to adapt to new living conditions. They would have to evolve quickly and get used to the constant shortage of water. Animals, for example, could shrink in size because of this. Many of them, due to the lack of grass and moisture, would switch to a strictly carnivorous diet. And of course, we would have to say goodbye to the huge abundance of marine life. Many fish would disappear forever. Humans, most likely, would make a big evolutionary step backward. Not only because we would lose a large number of resources and move to new territories, but also because we would also lose access to one of the most important sources of energy in the world, hydroelectric power. Without electricity, many factories would stop working. To say that this would cause a large-scale crisis for us all is sadly obvious. So our current ratio of water and land is the best possible option. If there was too little or too much water, the consequences would be awful. That's why we need to protect the current conditions with all of our might. Have you ever wondered what it would be like if every planet in our solar system was the size of Earth? Well, it's time to dive into this mind-boggling scenario. Let's imagine what each planet would look like if they were as big as our beloved blue planet. Would the barren red landscape of Mars suddenly become a lush green oasis? Would the massive swirling gas giant Jupiter just disappear? And how would it affect our solar system as a whole? Are we all doomed? Buckle up and let's find out! The first planet on our list is Mercury, the smallest planet in our solar system. But now, forget about the moon like Mercury, instead, Picture yourself on the surface of a super dynamic incandescent inferno. There are a lot of craters and active volcanoes around you, and right in front of you is a huge blinding bright sun. What a nightmare! But let's break these changes down. Well, along with the size of Mercury, both its mass and gravity would increase. In that case, it's possible that Mercury would have more atmosphere. Temperatures on Mercury are extreme not only because it's very close to the sun, but also because of its very thin atmosphere. So during the day, the temperatures there reach 800 degrees Fahrenheit. And at night, it becomes terrifyingly cold, down to negative 290 degrees Fahrenheit. But now, when the gravity is stronger, Mercury could have a denser atmosphere, so the heat would be better distributed across the planet. And the atmosphere isn't the only thing that could make it hotter. If Mercury became bigger, it would likely experience increased internal heating due to gravitational compression. And hypothetically, its tectonic activity could increase. In other words, more interesting landscape, more mountains, and more scary active volcanoes. Congratulations, you've turned Mercury into Venus 2.0. For us, all these changes wouldn't be very pleasant. Now it would become much harder to send our spacecraft there so it's better for Mercury to stay as it is, small, calm, and boring. 
basically the complete opposite of our next planet, Venus. So what would happen to Venus if it was Earth-sized? Actually, nothing. It wouldn't change at all. All because Venus is already almost the size of Earth. It's even called the Earth's twin. Although twin is a big word, of course. In reality, we couldn't be more different. Venus is often called the morning star because it's so bright and visible in the sky. But don't let its beauty fool you. This planet is one of the most inhospitable places in our solar system. Its surface is hotter than a freshly baked pizza, around 900 degrees Fahrenheit. And it's covered in thick clouds of sulfuric acid that would dissolve any human who tried to visit. So, unfortunately, you won't be planning any trips there anytime soon. So let's move on to a planet that, unlike Venus, could potentially become a new home for us, Mars. Picture yourself standing on Mars' surface, watching the blue sunset and breathing in a refreshing breeze of air. Yes, you read that right, air. Moreover, you could be surrounded by plants, animals, and basically feel like you're on Earth. But how is that possible? Bigger Mars would have a stronger magnetic field and gravity. This would lead to a richer and denser atmosphere. It would likely have a wider range of gases, including oxygen. Wouldn't that be cool? Also, a denser atmosphere could distribute heat across the planet, so Mars would become much warmer and cozier. And here comes the most important change, liquid water. Mars actually has some frozen water at its poles and in subsurface reservoirs. But with a stronger gravitational pull, it could potentially stabilize liquid water on its surface. Hooray! However, it's not all fun and games. New Mars would also have a volcanic personality. It's already geologically active, but now its internal heat and pressure would skyrocket. That means more frequent and more crazy volcanic eruptions. Imagine how exciting it would be to witness such eruptions on another planet if you manage to escape the consequences. In general, the planet could become greener and lusher, but not safer, although it would still be great to see it. But it's time to move on to the giants of our solar system. And if we're enlarging the planets before, now it's time to squeeze them really, really hard. If Jupiter became 11 times smaller, oh boy, what a disaster that would be. The first thing we'd notice is a change in gravity. And I say we'd notice because now we'd have no choice but to move somewhere. Jupiter experiences from 30 to 100 collisions with large asteroids per year. No big deal. All because of its strongest gravity, which attracts them all and protects us. But now our big protective brother has turned into a small baby. Say hi to a bunch of asteroids. Oh, and say bye-bye to Jupiter this planet is known for its thick, swirling atmosphere. But with a weaker gravitational pull, Jupiter would probably have a hard time holding on to it. So over time, it would slowly escape into space, leaving behind a thin atmosphere composed mainly of nitrogen and oxygen. We'll also have to bid farewell to the iconic appearance of another giant, Saturn. The most noticeable difference would be the disappearance of its famous rings. Made up of small particles of ice and rock, the rings are a unique feature of Saturn. But with Earth's gravity, they would either fall onto the planet or scatter into space. Bummer. Saturn is also a gas giant, just like Jupiter. Its atmosphere is made up of mostly hydrogen and helium. But if it were Earth-sized, its gases would be compressed due to the increased gravity. This would make it much denser. That means Saturn's overall size and shape would change. Theoretically, if we squeeze Saturn hard, it could potentially become a brown dwarf. It's a type of failed star that lacks the mass to sustain nuclear fusion, but emits heat and light. So Saturn could stop being a planet altogether. The weather on it would probably have changed too. All its crazy storms, such as the famous hexagonal storm at its North Pole, would have become weaker and calmer. The next giant is Uranus. Let's try to compress this poor fella. First off, the surface gravity on Uranus would be much weaker than it is now. Its atmosphere might also change. If Uranus was smaller, it could have a thinner atmosphere and different gases altogether. 
This planet is pretty chilly, with an average temperature of negative 353 degrees Fahrenheit. Ugh. But if it was the size of Earth, it might actually warm up a bit due to its reduced volume to surface area ratio. Don't get too excited though, it would still be way colder than the coldest spots on Earth. As you can see, gas giants don't easily go through all this shrinking, except perhaps one of them. Surprisingly, small Neptune would become much friendlier. For starters, it would probably be a rocky planet with a tiny atmosphere. That means no more gas giant, but instead, a planet that's easier for humans and critters alike to live and move around on. Speaking of movement, because of the smaller size, the gravity on this new Neptune would be almost the same as Earth's, making it a heck of a lot easier to walk and jump around. No more floating away into space. Now, the atmosphere of the original Neptune is so thick you could barely see your hand in front of your face. And the surface pressure is about 100 times that of Earth's atmosphere. But our new Neptune would be much different, with a much thinner and less dense atmosphere. It would still have some methane, water, and ammonia in it, but nowhere near as much as before. Finally, the temperature. <laughs> the current Neptune is freezing with an average temperature of about negative 370 degrees Fahrenheit. But if it was the same size as Earth, it would likely be much warmer, just like Uranus. Ah, that's more like it. What a planet that would be. That's it for the changes in the planets. But what would happen to the entire solar system if we made all the planets so small? It's hard to predict, but it's clear that their gravity and orbits could change a lot. It's unlikely that any of them would have flown into outer space, or crashed into each other, or something like that. But many of their orbits would probably become quite unstable, and the number of collisions with asteroids would have increased significantly. Of course all this is purely speculation, it's not like we can actually test all this, but it's still a pretty interesting thought experiment, and it makes you appreciate just how unique and special our solar system really is. Move over, Star Wars! Astronomers have discovered an exotic star system that puts you to shame. Did you know our solar system is a bit of a loner in the galaxy? Most stars actually have companions, and some even have multiple. For example, binary star systems are very common, consisting of two stars orbiting around a common center of mass. Usually, you can't see them with a naked eye. To an observer on Earth, they'll most likely mold together and appear to be one. For example, Alpha Centauri A and Alpha Centauri B together form a binary system. They're some of the brightest stars in their constellation and the third brightest in the night sky in general, outshined only by Sirius and Canopus. But if you look at them, they'll appear to be a single star. Although it's not always like this. There are also so-called double stars. They're located so close that they may seem like a binary system, and they can either be one or not. You can even do a little eye test. In the Big Dipper constellation, try to look for Mizar and Alcor. They're kind of hard to spot, but they're right there on the arm of the Big Dipper. Now, if you're able to see them not as one, but two, then you have good eyesight. And hey, why settle for just two stars when you can have more? Triple systems are also quite common, with three stars orbiting around each other in a delicate cosmic dance. These systems can be full of surprises, because the orbits are so difficult to predict. But all this pales in comparison with the recent discovery. A few years ago, a team of researchers discovered an actual five-star solar system. It's located 250 light-years away in the Ursa Major constellation and was discovered by the Super Wasp project. All of the stars there were formed from the same disk of dust and gas, and now they're connected in one complex gravitational dance. Now, this doesn't mean they're all incredibly close to each other. They don't do some kind of a square dance, you know. In fact, they're separated by more than the distance of Pluto's orbit around the Sun. Usually, such large systems consist of smaller ones. For example, in this case, there are two stars that are super far away. Two stars that are so close that one is practically stealing the other's hydrogen, you bad boy, and one tag-along lone companion but they all orbit around a common center of gravity. With all these interactions, it's a wonder they don't collide and create one big bright mess in the sky. 
But it's not surprising that each such system is more complex and rarer than the previous one. And this all raises the question, what kind of unique environments could exist in such systems? What would our life look like if we lived there? Well, let's see. Picture this, you're on a planet orbiting one of the stars in a quintuple system. It's a sunny day, and you're ready to hit the beach. As you step out of your space house, you look up at the sky and see not one, not two, but five suns shining bright like diamonds. Two of them are super close together, almost as if they were one. Then you see the other pair, a bit further apart, each with their own glow. And finally, the loner star in the corner just doing its own thing. It's overwhelming, to say the least. Now, you might be wondering, but what would the day-night cycle and changing of seasons look like on such a planet? Well, here things might get a little complicated. Depending on the orbits of the stars, the planet could experience pretty random daylight and darkness hours. They can even be constant or last for very long periods of time. All depends on the location of the planet. If we lived in a binary star system, things would be easier. There would be two distinct periods of day and night, as the planet orbits around the two stars. But with five stars, their brightness and position would be constantly changing, so the day-night cycle could get extremely chaotic. Hey, I need my sleep here! On the other hand, this would make for some pretty spectacular views. We could experience several different sunrises and sunsets, each of different brightness and color per day. The changing of seasons doesn't get easier. You know how on Earth we have four seasons caused by the tilt of our planet's axis in relation to the Sun? Well, in a five-star system, the locations of the stars could drive our planet insane. It's like having multiple chefs in the kitchen, all trying to cook different dishes at the same time. For example, if we're closer to star A, we experience more summer-like conditions. If we're closer to star B, things will be more chilly and wintry. And if we're located somewhere in the middle, we'll experience both summer and winter at the same time. It's like trying to juggle multiple balls at once. And this is a super simplified explanation. There are also things like the planet's orbital path, the tilt of its axis, the gravitational pull, yada yada. In short, the weather forecast will now become 10 times more unreliable. I'd hate to be the weather person on TV. That's a no-win scenario. And if that's not enough, then how about a roller coaster of radiation? The nasty solar winds and heat from multiple stars could make the conditions on our planet super harsh, rendering it uninhabitable. For example, if you're unlucky enough to live too close to the binary pair of stars, you'll feel like you're constantly stuck in a microwave. But hey, at least you wouldn't have to go to the tanning salon. And if you're too far away from the stars, it would be like living in an eternal winter wonderland. And if you're somewhere in the middle, well, imagine living in a place where you can get sunburn and frostbite on the same day. And this is just the beginning. You see, with five stars in the mix, there's a whole lot of gravity to go around. That's like being in a group hug with some really strong and clingy friends. The gravitational forces from the stars could tug and pull at the planet, creating tides so strong they could wash away entire cities. And don't even get me started on the earthquakes. With all that gravity, the ground beneath our feet would feel like it's constantly shaking, rattling, and rolling. On the bright side, though, <laughs> at least we'd always have an excuse for being late to work. Uh, sorry boss, I got caught in a gravity wave and ended up on the other side of the planet. Uh, you're not buying that, are you? As you can see, we'd have to try hard to adapt to such a system. All this, obviously, would create some challenges for agriculture. With multiple stars in the sky, plants would have to adapt to receiving light from different angles and intensities throughout the day. Farmers might need to create something to protect crops from excess heat and radiation. On the other hand, having multiple sources of energy from the stars is pretty awesome. Imagine fields of solar panels soaking up the rays from all five stars. But hey, maybe we would have been lucky and ended up on a planet where gravity and temperature changes wouldn't have bothered us so much. In that case, living in such a unique and inspiring environment doesn't sound too bad. It would have a great impact on our culture, arts, technology, and so on. With such a unique view of the cosmos, people would have a whole new canvas to work with. 
And just imagine, this isn't even the most complex of the systems we've discovered. For example, have you heard of AR Cassiopeia? It's a septuple star system, meaning it has seven stars orbiting around each other. Now you might be thinking, wow, that must be a real chaos. And you're not wrong. Imagine trying to navigate a spaceship through all those gravitational fields. It's like playing a game of cosmic pinball. But all this serves as a reminder of the incredible diversity of the universe. Scientists continue to study and learn more about these rare and fascinating systems. And who knows what other mind-boggling star systems are out there, waiting to be discovered. Systems of 10, 15 stars. Nearly as many stars as there are in Hollywood. Get it? Stars? Hollywood? Okay, I agree. It's lame. The Moon is the Earth's closest neighbor in space, and its only natural satellite. It likely formed when a huge Mars-sized object crashed into our planet billions of years ago. This catastrophe turned Earth into a scorching ball of molten rock, and it also pushed some material into its orbit, eventually creating the Moon. Now this heavily cratered sphere revolves around our planet, causing the high and low tides we enjoy around the globe. A bit more than one-fourth the size of Earth, it is the fifth largest natural satellite in the solar system. The Moon has several phases, for example, new, full, or crescent Moon, first and last quarter. But whatever the satellite looks like, you can always find it in the night sky, and sometimes even during the day. But now, imagine waking up at night, looking up into the night sky, and noticing that the Moon looks a little different than usual looks brighter and bigger. The difference is so slight, you assume you're just seeing things because you're half asleep. You go back to bed, blissfully unaware that instead of the moon, you've just seen Mercury. At first glance, this planet, the nearest to the sun, is similar to our natural satellite. Its surface is also littered with craters left by space rocks. But Mercury is around two-fifths the size of our planet, so it's a bit larger than the moon. This would mean a greater impact on our planet. Nights would become brighter, high tides would become higher, and low tides, you guessed it, lower. The lunar cycle, that's the time the moon, or rather Mercury now, needs to go through all the phases, would become 14 hours shorter. But all in all, such a replacement would not have any drastic consequences for our planet. All right then, how about Venus? What if we instead swap in the third brightest natural object after the Sun and the Moon? Venus is often called Earth's sister planet because their mass and size are nearly the same. And that would make a difference. Venus would be as large in our sky as Earth once appeared to the Apollo astronauts when they looked at it from the Moon's surface. The morning star, as it's often called, would be much brighter than the Moon. For one thing, it generally reflects six times more sunlight, but it would also occupy at least 16 times more space in the sky. That's why nights on Earth would be way brighter, as bright as early twilight now. If you looked at Venus from this distance, you'd even be able to make out the vague swirling patterns on the planet's yellowish-white cloud cover. But Venus wouldn't really become Earth's satellite. The two planets would likely orbit around their common center of mass, and this orbit would be quite eccentric, like me. But if Venus moved in the same speed as the moon does now, the two planets would eventually crash into each other. Uh-oh. Okay, let's pull another switcheroo. If Mars was up there in the sky instead of the moon, it would also be hard to ignore. The planet's disk would emit a reddish hue, and it would be almost twice the moon's size. Even without a telescope, you'd be able to marvel at its unusual color and the dark spots on its surface. And even if you didn't see the red planet, you would still feel its unusual effects on ours. Mars is half the Earth's size, but several times larger than the Moon. Replacing a smaller space body with a much larger one would increase the gravitational stress, upsetting the delicate balance on our planet. If you were unlucky enough to be at the seaside when Mars took the Moon's place, you'd have to evacuate as soon as possible. Massive waves would rise in the oceans under Martian influence. They would crash against the shoreline like the largest tsunamis. Mars would also reflect more sunlight than the moon, thus illuminating the night sky. However, this time with an eerie red tint. And you'd be able to admire the tallest mountain in the solar system, Olympus Mons, 
through a telescope. Mars isn't large enough to change the Earth's orbit dramatically. But with time, the two planets would probably begin to orbit each other, creating a binary planet system. And since Mars would be literally next door, voyages to it would become a whole lot more feasible. Pack your bags, kids! Okay, now for the big one. If Jupiter replaced the Moon, Earth would immediately lose its status as an independent planet. It would instantly turn into yet another moon of the largest planet in the solar system. But hey, at least people would have a beautiful sky view, right? Jupiter is dozens of times larger than the moon. A gigantic, beautifully striped, swirly sphere would cover nearly all of the horizon. If you had time to enjoy the show, you'd see yellow, brown, red, and white clouds floating in Jupiter's atmosphere. Sadly, you wouldn't have much time to enjoy the view, as the gas giant's gravitational pull would instantly cause severe earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, and tsunamis. Earth's mantle and crust would be drawn towards Jupiter, which would break the planet apart. It would be stretched and compressed with such force that its surface would bulge back and forth by more than 300 feet. On top of that, Earth's speed is only 10% of what is needed for us to stay in Jupiter's orbit. That's why our sluggish planet would crash into the gas giant in less than a day. Now, the rest of the planets on the list are smaller than Jupiter, but they're still ridiculously huge. So from here on out, expect to see similar results. But if Saturn was to replace the moon, it would truly be the most beautiful skyline to behold. I'm a little biased because Saturn is my favorite planet. It's more than 35 times larger than the moon, so it would cover 18 degrees of the sky. And its rings would stretch even further from horizon to horizon. At the distance the moon currently is, Earth would be a bit further away from Saturn than its own moon, Dione. And again, since Saturn is way more powerful than our planet, Earth would once again turn into a satellite. And again, Earth's rotational speed wouldn't be enough to keep it up in orbit, so we'd most likely crash into it in a day or two as well. But before burning up in Saturn's atmosphere, we'd have to pass through its magnificent rings. They're made up of pieces of comets, asteroids, and fragments of moons that shattered millions of years ago. It wouldn't be an easy feat to get through all that space debris. Plus, our planet would have to avoid all of Saturn's moons, all 53 of them. Does anyone know how to fly this thing? But even if Earth did somehow stay up in orbit and turn into Saturn's 54th moon, the gas giant's gravitational pull would still lead to massive tectonic shifts all over the globe. They would be tearing the planet's crust apart until there's nothing left. Not good either. Next up, twins. Uranus and Neptune are both ice giants. They are the same size, larger than Earth, but still smaller than Saturn or Jupiter. They both have icy interiors, deep atmospheres, and a similar color, a very mystifying bluish green. So if either of these planets replaced the moon, the consequences would be the same. So let's flip a coin. Okay, let's say that Neptune is the one you'd see in the sky one day. Neptune is 14 times larger than the moon. The planet would look like a bright blue hot air balloon in the sky, not only at night, but during the day too. It would appear to be 15 times larger than the sun. If everything else remained the same, a solar eclipse would seem to continue for ages. Once the sun would vanish behind Neptune's edge, our planet would be plunged into complete darkness for no less than an hour and a half, as opposed to our measly seven minutes and 32 seconds with the moon. <laughs> Neptune has 17 times the mass of Earth, so its gravitational pull is much stronger. That's why our planet would instantly become, say it with me now, a satellite. It would orbit Neptune at about the same distance as its own largest moon, Triton, only slightly further away. This means there would be a great risk of Earth colliding with Triton, which probably wouldn't go too well. But let's assume we were lucky enough not to cross paths with Neptune's satellite. Even so, there would be more than enough problems on our hands. For example, tides in our planet would become 1,000 times more powerful than those caused by the moon. Neptune's gravitational force wouldn't pull Earth apart, but it would heat it up significantly. The seismic activity would increase, setting off earthquakes and volcanic eruptions. And probably bork up the internet too. But of course, the most dramatic scenario would happen should the moon get replaced by the sun. See for yourself, the distance between Earth and its natural satellite is about 240,000 miles. 
but they are between 28 and 43 million miles between the Sun and Mercury. Even though this distance is huge, Mercury is still a scorched, deserted land. It experiences enormous temperature differences, from minus 280 degrees at night to 800 degrees during the day. So I'm sure it's no surprise to learn that if the Sun would suddenly appear as close to the Earth as the Moon is now, it would instantly burn everything off the planet's surface. You wouldn't even have a millisecond to wow at the blazing ball of plasma engulfing the whole sky. I'm afraid sunblock's not going to cut it this time. Typical solar flares are much longer than the Earth's diameter. Just one of them would be enough to melt the Earth's crust, burn its atmosphere, and wipe all forms of life off the face of the Earth. And then our blazing piece of molten rock would immediately be pulled in by the sun and vaporized on its surface. Fun! So, what do we learn from all this? More than anything, I think it highlights just how lucky we are to have the moon exactly as it is, exactly where it is. To try to replace it with anything else would only spell catastrophe for us here on Earth, sooner or later. Thanks, moon! And thank you for watching. If the sun decided to stop producing light, then the animals in the wild would be the first to notice. Most animals need daytime to roam from place to place, especially in the large savannas in Africa. Zebras, wildebeests, and giraffes all need the day to move to avoid predators. As soon as the sun goes down, it's their bedtime. If the sun suddenly went dark, animals wouldn't comprehend what was going on and would simply become an early lunch for predators. Nocturnal creatures would be equally confused at the time change. Birds usually flock during the day, so we wouldn't hear or see any of them. We have them to thank for eating pests in the sky. Well, them and bats. But if you're in an area with no bats, then consider the insects to be the winners here. Temperatures would start to drop gradually. Humans would notice the effects as well. We're used to having the sun shining at the peak of noon. But with the sunshine's disappearance, we would be living in total darkness. It'd just be a matter of survival. If the sun suddenly got dark, then we'd only have around eight minutes to enjoy the rest of it. That's because it takes that much time for sunlight to travel thousands of miles across the solar system. We would have to use UV lights to grow some crops, but it wouldn't be enough to feed the whole world, not to mention the dropping temperatures across the world. Survival would be difficult in the open plain. Everyone would have to duck inside shelters and warm bunkers. Plants need photosynthesis to grow. Without it, we wouldn't have any crops. Bread wouldn't exist, since it needs wheat. Even the algae in the oceans need photosynthesis to survive, which is the highest source of oxygen rather than forests. This means oxygen levels would start to deplete. Large bodies of water like lakes, oceans, and seas would also start to lack oxygen to sustain marine life. One of our main sources of vitamin D is the sun. There are other ways of getting it, but the sun is the best and most convenient way. Without crops or vegetation, all the herbivores would have to rummage for the last green grass on land or a leaf hanging from a tree. They would soon run out of food, which would also be bad news for us humans since we need animals like cows, horses, and sheep for our livelihoods. This wouldn't happen overnight. Of course, the oceans would remain warm for some time, but eventually, they would get cold and freeze. Earth is still a planet powered by an iron core that produces so much heat. This would not be enough to keep the planet warm. Our next step would be finding the right shelter and keeping warm. If this happened overnight, then chances are there wouldn't be any ready-made bunkers for a scenario like this. Unless you're watching this video and decide to build one after. They would have to provide heat 24-7 and be capable of growing crops under UV light. Solar-powered facilities would be a thing of the past. People would have to wear sustainable suits when venturing out into the open. Since it would be so dark, we would need strong lights or powerful night vision goggles to see anything. The lands would be desolate. Nocturnal creatures that can handle freezing temperatures would take it over. Structures would collapse, since there would be oxygen depletion. Concrete needs oxygen to remain intact. The bunkers themselves would have limited oxygen as well. 
we would need to uproot many trees and place them under strong UV lights for them to produce oxygen. In turn, it would produce its ecosystem in the large underground bunkers. The oceans on the surface would freeze over eventually. Gathering any natural resources from the ocean floor, like gas or oil, would be impossible. The large object, which used to be a bright and sunny star, would still be floating around. But what would happen if the sun disappeared overnight? Well, pretty much the same thing, except way worse. The sun is the largest celestial object in our solar system, which keeps all of our planets lined up the way they are. They orbit around the sun, minding their own business. Without such a large object keeping them steady, the planets would start to float around randomly. Some might even collide with each other. In other cases, the planets would just float around and fly off into space eventually, until they found a new star to orbit around. Earth might or might not be one of those planets. Our planet would still be dark. We would be flying through space at an unusual speed. The planet wouldn't rotate on itself, and many objects would crash into us. We'd be in the trajectory line of mass comets waiting to strike us down. The threat of the cold wouldn't be a major factor anymore. It would be what's beyond us. This means we'd have to dig our bunkers deeper. We wouldn't have an atmosphere anymore to trap any form of heat or anything. We would be floating for an eternity. But let's go back to that scenario where the sun just decided to go dark. Don't worry, our planet would still be orbiting the sun along with the other planets. The temperatures would keep plummeting until nothing could survive on the surface. It would be total darkness 24-7. Only bacteria and possibly tardigrades could survive on the surface. Tardigrades are microscopic critters that can survive just about anything, including outer space. Eventually, oxygen would be absent from the Earth's surface, and there wouldn't be anything up there anymore except for them. Since they would be the dominant and possibly the only creatures on the surface, they'd manage to evolve into bigger species and produce many more. Hundreds of thousands of years into the future, humans would have had to evolve to the conditions underground. Our eyes would be much bigger to take up as much light as possible. Our skin would become whiter since there would be no sun underground. Our hearing would also be much more sensitive since the underground would create echoing sounds. We'd still have the intellect we do now, but our bodies would be ready for the surface. The main threat would be the giant tardigrades sluggishly dragging themselves around. Under a microscope, they look kind of cute, but imagine them the size of a polar bear. Still want something like this in your backyard? They can live anywhere, so they'd infiltrate the bunkers now and then. They'd get ferocious and come in different sizes and shapes. At this point, humans would not be the dominant species since they'd have to hide underground. Some tardigrades from different tribes wouldn't be friendly with each other. Major cities that used to be bustling with people would be home to giant water bears. Tardigrades are known as water bears since they kind of look like little bears. But these beasts with eight legs would be much bigger than them. Bears and most animals would have been wiped out on the surface. Under the ice, some deep sea creatures would thrive and have moved closer to the surface. These animals were used to living in darkness away from the sun. But over thousands of years of dominating the waters, they'd have grown to enormous sizes. Some of these creatures would adapt to crawling out of the mainland. Even though the surface would be frozen, they'd still find ways to crack through the ice and make their way. Humans, meanwhile, would create large underground channels and networks, building cities and colonies. We'd dominate the tunnels where our hands and feet would grow to become web-like and large. We'd take over everything underground and remain the smartest species on Earth. We'd managed to keep old art pieces from the surface and important records to stay as human as possible. We'd keep on surviving no matter what. What would happen if our planet turned into two separate ones? One consisting entirely of land and the other one of water. Could we survive on any of them? And how? Well, you're lucky because I'm going to answer this question right now. So let's imagine that our Earth has turned into two separate planets sharing one orbit. Let's call these hypothetical planets rock and water. I know, I know, very original. Anyway, let's start with the rock because this one is much easier to imagine. All we should do is ask, 
What would happen if all the oceans on the Earth suddenly dried up? Now, we know that water is life. It covers 70% of the surface of our planet. There's so much water that even if all the oceans and seas disappeared, some of it would still be left in underground rivers, streams, and so on. But unfortunately, it would not be enough for us to survive. All sea creatures disappear. After some time, all other animals, plants, and of course, people share their fate. Completely dried forests burst into flames sooner or later and burn until there is nothing left but ashes. But hey, it's not that bad. Well, it is bad, but life can still exist, in some form. There are some bacteria that make cockroaches jealous. They're able to survive absolutely any conditions. For example, extremophiles have already evolved to live without water. These little guys can survive in an incredibly hot or acidic environment without water or even sunlight. Without them, the rock becomes an empty, lifeless planet. Although, who knows? Maybe someday extremophiles will be able to evolve into some wildly cool forms that can survive literally anywhere. But for now, the rock is just a floating rock, basically. Oh wait, did you imagine a hot desert or some sort of red-hot steps? Surprise, surprise! This planet is actually extremely cold. You see, without water, there would be no atmosphere. The atmosphere consists of a concentration of various gases, including hydrogen and oxygen. Some H and O, you know where this is going, right? Yep, no water, no atmosphere. And since it is the atmosphere that accumulates all the heat we need, the planet would be very cold without it. The contrast between cold and less cold places also becomes very sharp. You see, water is basically a climate stabilizer. The oceans absorb almost all of the heat of our sun. They distribute it evenly over the Earth to make sure it doesn't get too cold or too hot. So without it, the rock gradually turns into a cold desert. The average temperature on this planet is around minus 100 degrees Fahrenheit. At both poles, the temperature is extremely low, about minus 300 degrees. And even in the warmest places, it doesn't exceed 20 degrees. These warm places are now the former oceans, because their dried-up depths are located much closer to the hot core of the planet. Wait, I hope you don't imagine this planet as covered in snow, either. We don't have any water at all, remember? It's just a very cold rock. At this point, we're just a bigger and browner version of the Moon. The Moon is basically a waterless piece of Earth, after all. But hey, what happens to volcanoes? They're basically our last hope to stay warm, aren't they? Unfortunately, volcanic activity is decreasing due to a lack of water. You see, volcanoes and their eruptions happen because of the collisions of two tectonic plates, the oceanic and continental ones. The weight of the water presses on the oceanic plates. They go under the continental plates and form volcanoes. So if there's no water weight, then there's no volcanoes and volcanic activity drops significantly. The rock now is just a planet full of many incredible high mountains. And every time the tectonic plates collide, they form more and more of these mountains and trenches, including some very big ones, like the famous Mariana Trench. I would say, be careful not to fall, but hey, there's no one to fall there. So, Also, there's no weather anymore. No water means no more snow, ice, or rain, or even clouds. The wind would probably be quite strong, though. Well, that's the fate of the planet rock. Not very bright, so let's just go see how the water planet is doing. Many, many billions of years ago, I wasn't around then, our Earth actually was a planet entirely covered with water. Then, about a billion years ago, the sea level dropped. The land appeared. This has changed the atmosphere of our planet forever, and that's how life was born here. But what happens if it returns to its original state? Well... To answer that question, we should first learn more about the ocean planets. So what does one of these look like? Oh, sorry, I almost forgot. We have no idea. We haven't found any planets of this type because they're incredibly rare. I mean, there is one planet that is low-key and could be called an ocean planet. Yeah, I'm not even going to try and pronounce that. Still, even this one doesn't look the way you probably imagine. The water on it is in a very weird, unique state. Scientists have called this hot ice, or superliquid water, and we've never seen anything like this before. In general, though, the actual ocean planets are very hard to find due to many physical reasons. These planets require very specific temperatures, pressures, and so on. But alright, just hypothetically, what would such a planet look like? 
Well, first of all, of course, it cannot be made entirely of water. I hope you didn't actually think that there could be just some gigantic water blob spinning around a star. It should still be a planet with a core and some kind of foundation. So let's just imagine that all the water on the former Earth has mixed into one giant salty ocean. Wow, that would be a dream come true for the sea creatures, but not for the rest of us. The only animals that could survive in this situation, except fish, are probably the birds that can swim and feed on fish. Now, I think even if the sea level rose significantly, at least a couple of islets could still stay above the water. Such islands would be the former peaks of huge mountains like Mount Everest. So if these birds build their nests there, they can even survive for some time. But what about you and me? Well, we still have a chance. If we had enough time to prepare for the huge flood, we could stay safe either in giant submarines or on giant ships. We can grow food on board and fish from the ocean. But without the Everest Islands, we are unlikely to last long. If something breaks and we have nowhere to dock, we won't be able to fix it. Unfortunately, we no longer have drinking water. Now we can get it only from rain or by filtering seawater. But we have to store it someplace, right? And all these water containers would take up a lot of space and be very heavy. But in general, planet water is not as bad as it might seem. It's quite warm. The average temperature here is about 50 degrees Fahrenheit. And the gap between the lowest and highest temperatures is minimal, from minus 20 degrees at the poles to 70 degrees at the equator. Compared to planet rock, this ain't bad at all. Planet water would also be slightly larger than the Earth in radius due to the volume of, yes, water. The density of this planet would be, on the contrary, quite low. The gravity could become a bit weaker, too. Now, as for both planets, if we place them in the Earth's orbit, after some time, they would still move away from each other and follow different trajectories. They would have aligned themselves not to collide with each other. On one of them, the year would last 12 months, and on the other one, 10 or 11. And that's about it. A fun fact. All of this can actually happen in the future. First of all, the Earth's crust is gradually becoming thinner. Hey, I like thin crust. On my pizza. On my planet, mm, not so much. So, one day, water can really flood our entire land. On the other hand, in a couple of billion years, when our sun begins to expand and turn into a red giant, all the oceans on our planet will really dry up. Alright, take a deep breath and shake it out. That's enough of this grim fairy tale. It's a waste of time to worry about such things so far off when, today, I can't find my wallet anywhere. I thought I put it over here. Ah, Earth. The third rock from the sun. The blue planet. You get it. Its atmosphere is made up of around 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, and 1% argon, water vapor, and carbon dioxide. A nice balance for any living creatures to breathe. The weather here is also perfect for life to exist, unlike places like Saturn, Mercury, or any other celestial object in our solar system. We have the troposphere to thank for that. It's the densest part of the atmosphere on our planet and is 5 to 9 miles wide. It's the layer of the atmosphere that always affects our weather and secures the right conditions for life to exist and to have bodies of water. Earth is just sitting in its orbital path, minding its own business, revolving around the sun until, bam! Venus and Mars swoop in and spoil the fun. No one wants to leave poor Earth alone. These two relatively large celestial objects moving toward Earth will have dire consequences for our planet, starting with changes in its orbiting trajectory path. The planet's orbits in the solar system have to maintain the right balance so that nothing goes haywire. Of course, if any large object approaches Earth, it would throw our orbiting path off course. The planets will revolve around each other, which will cause plenty of natural disasters on our lands. This will also affect our rotation timing, potentially slowing it down. Days will not flow, but drag by. Animals that rely on daytime will need to readjust their biological clocks. Nocturnal animals will also need to figure out how to cope with the long nights. Humans have adjusted pretty well to the 24 hours a day timing. Time itself is just a human construct to measure things. We'll have a tough time sleeping and adjusting to the stretched day. Marine animals rely on the natural current flow to migrate around the oceans. With Mars and Venus crashing the party, 
it looks like they will also need to find new paths. Birds migrating to other lands throughout the year will also be confused and not know what to do. In general, the Earth's temperature will rise, and massive heat waves and permanent climate changes will occur. This brings us to our next issue, the heat. The radical temperature rise will turn everything into a barren desert. It'll be summer all year long, especially if Venus is in the picture. Most of the planet will dry up and won't be suitable for growing crops. Venus is hot, I mean really hot. Even though it's not the closest planet to the Sun, it's still the hottest. The temperatures on Venus are close to 900 degrees Fahrenheit, which will melt you like an ice cube. The lands on Venus are generally flat, probably due to the temperatures. It's mainly hot because its atmosphere is thick and traps the hazardous gases inside. If Venus inches its way towards us, it'll invite those gases to our atmosphere and compromise it. Mars, or the red planet as we know it, is very cold. That might stay the same if it starts rotating around us. It's also home to the largest dormant volcano in our solar system, which makes Mount Everest look like a tiny bush compared to a tree. With so much instability, it might just wake up one day and spew out molten lava. Mars has a very thin atmosphere, which makes the planet chilly. Its gravity is quite similar to ours. It's actually very cold and has ice caps in the poles covered with carbon dioxide. The same is true for Mercury. You can only last there as long as you can hold your breath and be in the sweet spot between the sunrise and sunset. The three planets orbiting each other will eventually collide. It's just a matter of time. And the moon, just hanging out like a fly on the wall, will be so insignificant that something will eventually throw it off course and another planet will capture it to its orbit. Or, in the most dire case, it will collide with one of the two intruding planets. Earth will experience extreme tidal waves like nothing before. The two new planets revolving around Earth will cause a major imbalance, making our gravity shift out of control. Each tidal wave will be bigger than the previous one and will cover the dry land. Plenty of little scattered islands in the oceans will be completely submerged. Coastal cities and towns will also be home to fish. Flat countries, in general, will need boats to get around. Dams and dikes won't be enough to stop the water from coming in. Everyone needs to move towards higher ground to escape the floods. With the climate getting hotter, the polar caps will melt like ice cream on a sweltering summer day and add to the water level rising. Within a few months, the whole Arctic will be nothing but liquid. But wait, there's more! The crust will wear out due to the instability of the Earth's surface and fluctuating gravity. The Earth's crust is mainly made up of oxygen, which means we're basically walking on air. We might experience more earthquakes than before, and dormant volcanoes will wake up from their deep slumber. The skies will be covered in ash, making flights impossible. No one can travel by sea or by air. Importing and exporting will become history. The overall climate will get hotter, just like in Venus. The three planets orbiting each other and their huge mass might even unintentionally welcome other planets and celestial bodies to join the party. So, what if Jupiter decided to turn up? Now, Jupiter is the largest planet in our solar system. To give you an idea, the Earth would be just the size of a grape if Jupiter were the size of a basketball. It also has the largest storm we can perceive. That's known as the Red Spot, a place twice the size of Earth that has hurricane-like storms that have been going on for hundreds of years. Now, by the time you're done watching this video, you can expect the storm to still be going at it. Since the planet is huge, gravity must be quite strong here. It also has many moons, some of them of our little Earth. There will be no room for any proper space among the planets. Jupiter's moons will be thrown off course and latch onto other planets around. Some of the moons might collide with each other, causing massive debris to be displaced all over the place. The gravity of the planetary party will attract comets to enter the atmosphere, potentially crashing down on us. Oxygen levels will deplete, so the Earth's crust crumbling will continue. It'll rip open the ozone layer, causing heavy strokes of ultraviolet waves to enter our atmosphere. We won't be able to step outside for too long without some protective gear and oxygen tanks. Human civilization will change drastically. 
We'll all live in sheltered containers that will provide clean air and safe and filtered sun rays. The shelters will be sturdy enough to withstand frequent earthquakes. We will grow only enough crops to sustain ourselves until we leave the Earth. Since it'll only be a matter of time before the planets collide, the next step would be to create large rocket ships to fly us out of the Earth. With Mars, Venus, and Jupiter revolving close to us, it won't be easy to do so. All the space debris will be blocking us from exiting the space zone area. The only safe place outside this region will be many millions of miles away, where only single planets exist. They may or may not have the conditions to host life, but humans will have the technology to land just about anywhere with similar gravity and construct the right shelters. Eventually, Mars, Venus, Earth, and Jupiter will collide with each other and break like eggs, like a big space omelet. Don't forget the moon's crashing and breaking in the mix, but we'll already be far, far away by then, hopefully. The large ball of fire thousands of miles away from us is the brightest object in our solar system, as well as the biggest. If Jupiter was the size of a basketball, then the Earth would look like a tiny little grape. But the Sun makes even Jupiter look like a joke. That big burning ball in the sky is made up of hydrogen and helium, and is 864,000 miles in diameter, making it more than 100 times wider than our little blue planet. It's 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit just on the surface, and 27 million degrees at the core. The Moon, on the other hand, is a little easier to grasp at at around 2,160 miles in diameter, which is only less than a third of Earth. It might seem pretty big floating in the sky, but that's because it's the closest object to us. But what if the tables, or in this case, celestial bodies, have turned, and the Moon suddenly became brighter than the Sun? Let's explore several scenarios. Scenario 1. If the Moon becomes brighter than the Sun, the nights will be brighter than days. It means your sleep cycle will be disrupted. All nocturnal animals will be utterly confused. When is it time to go out and eat now? In the extreme north and south poles, the nights and days are for months on end. So people living in the area already have an idea of what it's like to sleep at 11 p.m. with the sun shining brightly above them. For the rest of us, it won't be easy. Let's say you're out camping and prepare an awesome meal and gear up for the dark nights. As you trek into the forest, you find a spot that has an awesome view of the lake and the clear sky above. It's 7 p.m. and you start a fire for some s'mores and get the telescope ready. The only problem is that when the sun begins to set, the moon lights up the sky even brighter. It's surprisingly not as hot as you'd imagine since it's not direct sunlight. But regardless, it's still pretty hot. Scenario 2. Temperatures will surely rise either way. That means snow will melt away faster than you can go. What? What's going on? The snow on the mountains will be the first to melt, followed by the polar caps. With so much heat, the sea levels will rise and take small remote islands scattered across the ocean underwater. Coastal towns will go down and everyone will live closer inward. This will likely cause a chain reaction in the world economy. There will be no more winters, which means no more winter activities like skiing, snowboarding, or snow fights. Animals and plants all around the world will be affected. The world will turn into a large desert. Water will get scarce over the years, but people will find a way to preserve it. Scenario 3. You're sitting behind your desk, bored. You're losing business. People aren't buying as many sunglasses as you thought. But when the moon suddenly becomes brighter than the sun, and everyone needs to wear those glasses 24-7 when heading outside, you can't keep up with the demand for sunglasses. So you hire more people and grow your business. You eventually become the best sunglasses business in the country. They don't recommend looking up at the sky at any point of the day or night. Cities are covered with large visors to reduce the brightness every day. Sunglasses will come in different sizes and shapes for different times of the day. Some will be like goggles strapped around your head, while others will be like large helmets. Scenario 4. The moon's atmosphere is so thin that it can't contain anything in it. 
Just like over deserts on Earth, there are no clouds to bring some rain, which is why it's always hot or cold. Yeah, the biggest desert in the world is the whole continent of Antarctica, which is a cold, barren desert, contrary to what people think of the Sahara Desert. So if you still want to land on the moon, you better think twice now. People who are working at the International Space Station will have to find a new office. The moon will be too bright to bear, considering how close they are. If the moon is just brighter than the sun without the heat part, then the space station will only require adjustments to keep the light out. The reason why we see the moon in various shapes is because of its position in relation to the sun. The moon doesn't rotate, unlike Earth. It's kind of glued to us and is always showing the same side. So, depending on the moon's position during the month, we'll have a super bright night during the full moon and relatively shiny nights during the rest of the month. Scenario 5. If the moon became brighter than the sun, it would produce more heat than the sun and probably become larger. Gravity on Earth would change significantly because of the moon's new size. The whole orbit structure would change and affect the celestial objects floating in space. Planets would soon begin to orbit around the moon. Earth might move further away from the sun. If that happened, then everything would have to readjust to the radical changes in gravity. Weak gravity means buildings wouldn't have a solid foundation to sit on and would eventually collapse. Bridges and large monuments would also fail to hold up. People wouldn't be able to walk properly and would do it in a funny way. Scenario 6 In many of these scenarios, I mentioned how the moon would be brighter than the object emitting light. But in this case, the sun would have to come from the moon reflecting from the sun, which means that the sun would have to be twice as bright as it is now. If the sun got 100 times bigger, it would shoot out more rays, which can be damaging and throw off a lot of radiation, harmful to every living thing on Earth. The gravitational pull of the sun might attract more planets to orbit around it and cause other objects in space to join the orbit. The planets would be partying in our galaxy club, and we might be thrown off our orbit course. Of course, this would pose a bigger risk to everything on Earth as things would get hotter and drier than before. Scenario 7. If we're talking about the moon getting brighter, we can also assume it would get closer to Earth than it is now. The brightness won't be the problem here as gravity will cause major changes on Earth. But every day, 24-7 will be high tide. It will be so extreme that there will be constant floods in every coastal town. All islands will be submerged, which will increase the population of inland cities. Marine life will be having the time of its life when water overtakes the land. Boats will have to be re-engineered for new conditions as well as submarines. Air travel will be the priority, but large cruise ships will look futuristic and have an extra build to sustain the harsh waves. Nighttime will be pretty bright on regular days. It will raise the global temperature which will melt down the snow, causing the sea levels to increase even more. Comets and other celestial objects will be drawn to a closer gravitational pull, so we will always have to look up whenever we go outside. But no worries, the moon is still up there as it is for a very long time. The Earth and the moon's relationship is complicated. Luckily, we only have one natural satellite. Other planets in our solar system have multiple moons revolving around them. Some are so huge that they're the size of Earth. Imagine several of those affecting our home. But that's a topic for a completely different story. It's becoming colder by the minute. The temperature drops below zero very quickly. And although there's no snow, the cold is becoming unbearable. Hoarfrost appears on the ground, the grass and the trees and ice forms on bodies of water at an incredible rate. Shivering people all over the planet raise their eyes to the sky, and their jaws drop in disbelief. The sun has become twice as small as it used to be. It now looks like a distant speck, and it won't be able to heat the Earth any longer. But the worst thing is, there's a huge blazing rock coming right at the horrified spectators from the sky. And the impact with that thing will undoubtedly do a lot of damage. Okay, let's go back to our objective reality. The Earth is exactly in the sweet spot of our solar system. 
It's neither too close nor too far from the sun, making the temperature on our planet not just tolerable, but rather pleasant. Scientists often call Venus the second planet from the sun, our Earth's evil twin, because it's so hot and inhospitable that no life is possible on it. Of course, there are thick clouds in its atmosphere that rain acid, and the greenhouse gases raise the temperature on the surface to unbearable values. But even if Venus didn't have those, nothing would still be able to live there because of the proximity to the sun. If there was any liquid water, it would evaporate too quickly, leaving life no chance to develop. On the other hand, Mars, going next in line after Earth, is a bit too far away from the sun, which makes it cold and lonely. The temperature on its surface is below freezing, and it never warms up enough for water to stay liquid for long. That's not to mention the lack of atmosphere on the red planet, the element that provides the Earth with breathable air. So, if our planet shifted closer to or farther away from the sun, its temperature would either rise or fall respectively. A few hundred miles wouldn't make much difference. The circling of Earth around the sun is uneven anyway, and we constantly get nearer to our star or fly a bit away from it. The distance that would matter is measured in millions of miles. And yeah, just like I showed you at the beginning of this video, we'd see the sun a lot smaller than we do now if we went that far. The temperatures might not fall at the exact moment of the shift, as there would still be some warmth left. But in the following winter, our planet would probably stay cold forever. The oceans would be covered with ice, and the overall sea level would drop. And ultimately, the ice would reflect more of the sun's heat back into the atmosphere and space, not allowing the surface of our planet to get the necessary warmth. And more ice means less water vapor in the atmosphere. Water vapor captures heat too, creating clouds. So the colder it is, the less rain. The cold and the lack of rain would not let any plants survive for long. So the areas of icy and barren landscape would grow fast, leaving only the areas along the banks of rivers intact for a while. After some time, the rivers would stop running too either frozen or dried out because of losing their sources, lakes and seas, which would, of course, freeze as well. Any life dwelling near them would disappear. Plants first, and with them, everything else, since plants produce both food and breathable air. And with that, the Earth would become a frozen wasteland. As for the giant blazing rock I mentioned, it was an asteroid coming from outer space because of the shift of our planet's orbit. Jupiter, the largest planet in our solar system, acts as a natural shield for us against space rocks. It has a huge mass, and most asteroids flinging from outer space get caught in its gravity and fall on its surface. There's no life possible on Jupiter, and its surface is gaseous, so asteroids tend to disappear in it without a trace. Still, some manage to get past Jupiter, where Mars comes into play. It also contributes to our defense by holding the asteroid belt between itself and Jupiter in place. The two planets' combined mass creates a gravitational field that doesn't allow the asteroids from the belt to fly in random directions, hitting everything in their path. If there was no Mars between us and the belt, we'd be used to meteor showers almost more than actual rains. Say the Earth has replaced Mars in its orbit, and now we're hundreds of millions of miles farther away from the Sun. The mass of the Earth is more or less similar to that of Mars, so the asteroid belt is still in its place. The temperatures will still fall though, and life will soon go extinct. But if Mars stayed where it is, and the Earth just shifted away, it would be a recipe for disaster. There's no chance the planets would orbit the Sun at the same rate because their mass is not equal. At some point, they would collide with each other. Taking their speed into account, they'd both crack and shatter, perhaps creating another asteroid belt in our solar system. 
It would be no more hopeful for us if the Earth decided to jump closer to the sun. Apart from the star seeming more like a giant, pitiless blazing ball in the sky, its heat would melt the glaciers on our planet, making sea levels rise abruptly. The water would flood major parts of the continents, and more surfaces of the planet would be covered with water, which means more heat absorption. That would bring about a further rise in the temperature. Also, those large bodies of water would evaporate like crazy, releasing tons of water vapor and carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas that absorbs heat, and so does water vapor. Together, they would trap more and more of the sun's warmth, creating thick, roiling clouds in the sky, almost like on Venus, but without the acid. And that thick blanket of clouds would also contribute to heating the surface of our planet. In the end, the entire Earth would heat up so much that life on its surface would become unbearable for most. Only the sturdiest of creatures would be able to survive temperatures so high. Those that dwell in our deserts, for example. Despite the rainfall, which wouldn't cease as in the cold scenario, plants would still have difficulty adapting to the new and hot environments. The ones in the cooler regions of the planet would be the first to wilt and go. But then, plants from the moderate and finally tropical climes would also give up. And yet again, the Earth would turn into a barren ball of rock, only this time an overheated one rather than frozen. Our planet's distance from the Sun, its tilt, its speed of rotation around its own axis, its orbit around the Sun, and even the presence of the Moon in its skies, all of that is crucial for life on Earth to exist. For instance, if the planet wasn't tilted relative to the Sun, it would be unbearably hot on the equator and impossibly cold at the poles. The seasons would also stop changing, dividing the Earth into strips of endless summer and winter. Our planet is heated up evenly from all sides, with the current tilt and rotation like you would roast a barbecue. It turns to the sun with one side to warm it up, while the other cools down during the night. Were there no change of night and day, we'd probably only live in some areas of our planet where constant, never-ending twilight would be. Just imagine our life without those beautiful sunrises and sunsets. Maybe we'll just let it stay as it is, okay? Imagine all the planets from the solar system had a meeting and decided that Earth should move to another galaxy. Then what? Well, my friends, if Earth got kicked out of the solar system, let's just say we'd be in for a bumpy ride. As you may know, each planet occupies its own orbit in relation to the Sun, guaranteeing the perfect functioning of our solar system. But it wasn't always like this, though. Billions of years ago, planets and asteroids kept constantly bumping into each other. It took some time before each planet found its own personal orbit, and our system took the formation it has today. Now, as you may know, the most important organizing factor of the solar system is gravity. Gravity attracts every piece of matter to every other piece of matter in the universe. And the bigger the mass, the bigger the gravity. The Sun makes up 99.75% of all the mass in the solar system. It's precisely the Sun's gravitational pull that has kept Earth on a steady and reliable path. But it wouldn't take a surreal interplanetary meeting for Earth to go rogue. This is an actual possibility. An unlikely, but real one. For instance, if any rogue planet or star were to travel close to the solar system, its gravitational force could mess up our planetary organization. And did you know that this has actually happened before? Some 70,000 years ago, a red dwarf pass through the Oort cloud and mess things up. The Oort cloud is an outer circle of space debris located on the edge of our solar system. It lies far beyond Pluto and the Kuiper belt and surrounds the Sun in a giant spherical shell. Apart from the eight planets and the Kuiper belt, there is another asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. 
Now, scientists expect another red dwarf to pass by our solar system. It's an orange star from the constellation of Serpens Cauda. Astronomers expect it to pass near the Sun in about 1.29 million years, at a distance of about 99 billion miles. This star has about 60% of the mass of the Sun, which would be enough to cause a great disturbance in our system. Once the star entered our system, we'd be able to see it in the night sky without any equipment. It would be like watching a small orangish dot appearing in the sky. Over the months, it would grow bigger and bigger until we'd see it during the daytime. At a certain point, it would become so big and bright that we wouldn't be able to look at it directly. Just like people say we shouldn't do with the sun, but we look at it directly anyways, right? At this moment, the night sky would fill with an eerie red glow. And after a few months, the orange star would start shrinking again, turning smaller than the sun. But then, wait, the sun is turning smaller too. Well, yes. The passing of Gliese 170 took Earth out of its orbit, and its gravitational force pulled us out of our natural alignment. Now the Earth will roam through the solar system until it reaches outer space. So, what would happen with our planet if this were to really happen? First, the Earth would leave what is known as the Goldilocks Zone, also known as the Habitable Zone. It's a rather narrow part of the solar system where human life can thrive. What's its success secret? Water in a liquid state. Astronomers have discovered that Mercury also has water, but only in its northern and southern poles, where light never reaches. Pluto, the dwarf planet at the rear end of the solar system, is 30% water, but much of it is hiding under a thick layer of ice. If the Earth ever did leave its privileged place orbiting the Sun, it would travel around the galaxy at its orbital speed of 67,000 miles per hour. That's 1,000 times faster than a cheetah can run. Pretty fast, huh? So, in about more or less a month, humanity would see the red giant Mars on the horizon. By then, we would be getting around 44% of the sunlight we once had. If someone wanted to begin a new civilization, this would be the perfect moment. With reduced sunlight, it would be more difficult for plants to continue doing photosynthesis so most of the flora on our planet would begin to perish. A few days after leaving Mars's orbit, our planetary spaceship would face its first challenge, traveling through the asteroid belt. It's a collection of small, rocky, metallic bodies. They're basically leftovers from the Big Bang that created our solar system 4.6 billion years ago. So, in a way, it's almost like we were traveling in time, right? Luckily for us, the distance between one asteroid and the next is about 600,000 miles. So, after passing one asteroid, it might take us a while before running into the next. If we make it through this journey intact, then we'll see the first gas giant in our galaxy, Jupiter. Up until this moment, our loyal moon has been following us as we travel inside the solar system. But, uh-oh. Jupiter's huge mass might steal our moon away from us. After all, Jupiter's gravity is twice as strong as Earth's. If our moon did join Jupiter's orbit, it would be no less than its 80th moon. A bit too many moons, if you ask me. At this point in our travels, the Earth's atmospheric temperature would have fallen drastically to around negative 229 degrees Fahrenheit. So, life on Earth would only be possible in very specific places. Most of our planet's water would be frozen at this point, but only on the surface. Thanks to the Earth's core activity, it would heat our oceans from below, allowing heat to escape and maintain some water in the liquid state. In fact, the Earth's core would remain active for billions of years after it has left orbit. In this scenario, Microbes living near hydrothermal vents would thrive. 
but perhaps some life would also be possible near the heat provided by thermal vents above the surface in places like Yellowstone Park. A great option for humanity would be to build cities deep underground. This would be our best bet if we wanted to keep human life on planet Earth. Ten years after our departure, we would be deep into the interstellar voyage. We'd be over 2.8 billion miles from the sun. Our solar system would be nothing but a distant memory. If you were still living on Earth at that point, then you'd probably be coexisting with great technological advancements. Humans could build entire underground cities using geothermal energy. Maybe we'd even discover how to turn ice into power and create a sustainable and abundant system for fuel. Ice would also be our main source of water. And by then, the transformation process wouldn't be as expensive. Underground crops would thrive, but some plants would be better than others. Moss, fungi, and algae would be some great alternatives, as they are much easier to farm and grow in large numbers. This would mean that most of our diet would be plant-based, as it might be hard to keep grazing animals under the ground. Humanity could go on living thousands of years this way. If Earth happened to pass by some star with a habitable planet, we might even attempt to make a home on another planet. Spaceflight would become easier without the atmosphere in the way. So, yep, the idea of venturing into other planets would no longer seem too surreal in this scenario. The only thing that we would rather not happen to us is Earth running into a black hole. If that happened, let's just say we'd all be turned into spaghetti. Not literally, but we would go through a process that is called spaghettification. In this case, planet Earth, and everyone still living on it, would be vertically stretched up to the point of, well, vanishing. But that's the subject of another video. Fortunately, even if all this could be true, we wouldn't be caught by surprise. Thanks to scientific and technological advancements, we would be able to predict if a star were to pass too close to our home planet. And even if we couldn't stop a star, we would most certainly manage to do everything to prepare. So, who knows? Maybe the future generations will be watching this video, surprised at how precisely we figured the future out. Now, you wake up one morning and watch the news while having your morning coffee. They did it again! Those scientists! The news anchor yells on the TV. A report was released a few days ago that the moon is moving further away from Earth's orbit. Its distance extends 2 inches per year. Over the past 2,000 years, it's drifted a total of 260 feet. This isn't too daunting of a distance, but the news has still made people panicked and concerned. They rally together around the planet, uniting to try and stop the moon from escaping Earth's orbit, even though it won't actually leave the orbit for over a billion years. But everyone was focused on the past benefits of the moon. It's obvious life on Earth as we know it wouldn't have evolved without its existence. The moon is controlling the tides and the molecules in the atmosphere. Without it, humans, in particular, wouldn't have evolved. So, with an appreciation of the moon, the top brass ordered the best scientists to come up with a solution to push the moon closer towards the Earth. A giant thruster engine was built on the dark side of the moon. It was ignited, and the thrusts tried to push forward, but the startup power wasn't strong enough to push the moon. Instead, it tilted the moon's axis, rotating it slowly. As the moon rotated, the scientists hurried to turn it off before the engine reached its full power as it was headed off course. The brass didn't accept this and ordered them to continue with the objective. The scientists insisted the math wasn't correct and didn't know exactly what may occur. Their concerns were ignored, and they watched as the engine's power increased. The engine slowly pushed the moon, the distance reducing. But as it was provided at the wrong moment, the angle it was aimed at would provide complications. The thrust and gravity from the Earth ensured the moon followed the orbit at a reduced distance. But with the combination of the initial thrust on an indirect angle, the moon was directed away from the Earth, 
quickly moving further off its trajectory on a path to leave the orbit altogether. As you finish your breakfast and turn the TV off, you go outside to look at the moon. It sits high above, seemingly fine. Surely, the news anchor was just exaggerating. You go to work. The issues of the moon are now just an afterthought. Even if it was true, how could it possibly affect your day? The morning feels normal, just another day at the office, as it turns out. During your lunch break, you head into town and notice on your way that the wind is picking up, getting stronger and colder. It must be a storm approaching. You quickly check on the moon. It appears smaller, about half the size of what it was this morning. But it's midday, so it's supposed to be that size, isn't it? After you finish your meal at the restaurant, you leave to find it's becoming darker. The wind is much stronger than earlier, but there are no storm clouds in the sky. People in the streets are pointing towards the sky, shocked at something, probably an eclipse. As people begin running in the streets frantically, you look above and can't see the moon. Confused by everything, you decide to head home for the day. When you arrive home, you turn on the TV. The news anchor, who is now more serious than earlier, explains that the moon has left the Earth's orbit altogether and is flying off somewhere into space. The loss of the moon means the daily cycle has changed. Now, there are only 6 to 12 hours of sunlight a day, and over a thousand days per year. I only have to work half as much, you say excitedly, pumping your arms in the air. The lack of the moon creates a completely different world. The pull of the moon's gravity is what keeps the Earth in a place at 23.5 degrees angle, ensuring the weather patterns and normal days that we're accustomed to. Baffled by all the scientific information, you go outside to just confirm you aren't being pranked. The shorter working week seems too good to be true. As you look out into the sky, you notice the stars are brighter than you have ever seen. You can clearly see the outline of the Milky Way's arms. The stars are far more numerous than you remember, with Venus glowing far brighter than them all. It's a beautiful sight but you're not sure whether a clearer night sky was worth the moon's removal. You have never been interested in astronomy. You decide to go to bed. It's a good idea to adjust to the new night and day cycle. You set your alarm for two hours. That should be enough, you say to yourself happily. Tomorrow is Saturday, after all. You need to get up early to go surfing. Gotta catch those high tide waves. You wake up, get your things together, and drive to the beach. The news on the radio explains some issues about how the Earth is now more defenseless to asteroids without the moon. Then they talk about some issues with the tides. Something about how the tide is now one-third the size it used to be before. You're unsure how this could affect the waves. Maybe it means they will be larger. You park at the beach, grab your board, and look towards where the surf should be. It should be high tide. But the sea is somehow a lot further away than normal. You shrug off the hurdle of having to walk towards the water. After a long, enthusiastic walk toward the gnarly waves, your mood changes as you approach, staring blankly at the tiny waves. Upset, you head home. While driving, you listen to the news and pay more attention to the information provided. In place of structured seasons, There are only erratic weather patterns. Winds are faster and stronger, creating more powerful storms. And in some places, there are just stagnant conditions. The equator is no longer always warm. The poles aren't constantly cold. The depths of water shrink. Tides only adjust to the sun's gravity, reduced to a third of the pre-moon depths. Throughout the world, the seas change in altitude shrinking at the poles, and the bulge of water around the equator shifts. The moon regulated the tides and provided the periodic changes that were a key element to assisting with life on Earth. Aquatic life forms are displaced within shallows worldwide. Life cycles of important microbial life have been upset. You couldn't imagine that something as simple as a change in the tides could be so important to billions of life forms. 
water and precipitation, which is distributed across the globe, cannot provide sustenance where they did before. The weather has become more extreme, hotter for longer periods and colder for other parts of the Earth. Over time, some thousands of years in the future, dry deserts will transition into ice ages. These intense changes disrupt the natural order of all things for life on Earth. Not only did the moon control the tides and weather, but it used to pull molecules within the atmosphere as it moved. The now constant movement disrupts molecules, creating barriers for future evolution. You arrive home upset after learning the disheartening news. Not only will you never be able to surf again, but all life on Earth will change. An age of devolution has begun. Over the next year, flora and fauna change to adjust to this new world. Migratory animals that would travel toward greener pastures find nothing at all. Birds are completely confused, with no end to the change in seasons. Hibernating animals delve in and out of their shelters at the incorrect times, and vegetation struggles to grow at the lack of sunlight. Nocturnal animals cannot see without guided assistance from the reflection of the moon. Although Venus is the brightest source of light when it's dark, it's only a thousandth of a fraction as bright as the moon was. Predatory animals that hunt during the night are not capable of finding their prey, providing an opportunity for smaller animals to thrive. Although life on Earth has changed, it will continue to exist. But the sudden adjustments will become a test for all walks of life. Over time, it will be very interesting to see what species have adapted and evolved. A world where rats and mice would be more prominent due to their adaptive capabilities could create a new dominant species to emerge. In millions of years of evolution, their descendants will primarily flourish. We could see buffalo-sized mouse herbivores crossing the plains and tiger-sized rats roaming within the jungles. Tree-faring mice with long arms may swing amongst the branches. Others will probably move to the seas in place of mammals to feed upon aquatic life. Wide-eyed predatory rats may occur to have similar traits to bats, with echolocation, becoming the conquerors of pitch-black nights. All the new species that will emerge, undoubtedly, will continue to be monitored by humans, wherever we may be. Whoa, the light from outside your window just got brighter. It's 9.30 in the evening, and you have a huge exam coming up tomorrow. You peek outside to see if your neighbors use their floodlights again. But they're outside looking up in the sky. You stick your head out and notice that the moon got a lot bigger, double in size. You run outside and ask people what's going on. But they don't have a clue either. You take a picture of it and post it on social media. You view your feed and see that everyone is talking about it. The dark sky is brighter because the moon has more real estate to reflect light from the sun, making the light more intense. You can feel a slight imbalance while walking. Every time you take a step, it feels like you're walking lighter than usual. Because the moon became so large, its gravitational pull became stronger, so gravity became weaker. Suddenly, you look below you and feel your socks are wet. You run and hop on the top of a car and see that there's water flooding your neighborhood. Everyone tries to find higher ground or run back to their houses. This isn't a fire hydrant that busted and is spewing out water. This is ocean water seeping in. You're confused and lose your balance. You slip and fall in the water as it rises. Some people are in their cars, but they can't drive anywhere because of the water. You live near the ocean, but there has never been a tsunami or any flood reports in your whole life. There are no reported earthquakes around the area, so something strange is happening. You run back to your house, trying to see if you can get out your old inflatable raft to help you with the flood. The only problem is that you need to inflate it but don't have your pump. You inflate it with your mouth at first, but it'll take forever to pump it up. You search around your house for an alternative and find your hairdryer. You plug it in and inflate the raft as much as you can until you use your mouth to do the rest. The water level rises by every second and has now entered your house. 
You pack up a bag with a good flashlight, some food, and thermal blankets. You go downstairs and see that the water is now at your knees. You keep walking until you reach the door. When you step outside, the water pushes you left and right since the waves are very harsh. Since gravity has changed, it's not easy to swim around. You get your raft ready and use it to float yourself down the current in your street. It doesn't help that the water is freezing, and you're in the middle of February. After a while, you reach the highway where water is coming directly from the beach. You manage to get on a high surface and take out your phone. You kept it in a protective compartment in your bag for safety. You only have 15% battery left, but you brought your power bank. You call your family to see what's going on, but they too have no idea. You venture into the forest and try to spot an old cabin you used to visit as a child to see if you left your old bicycle there. After a few minutes, you find it and bike across the mountain to escape the flood. You can't seem to balance yourself since the gravity is affecting you. Some scientists sit around with laptops and spreadsheets, attempting to understand what's happening. Everyone is shouting and throwing out random solutions, but nothing seems to make sense. After a while, the head of NASA decides to launch an unmanned rocket to the moon. The rocket is ready in a few hours, and everyone is awaiting orders. 3, 2, 1, blast off! The rocket soars in the air and approaches the moon. It exits the Earth's atmosphere and travels at full speed in that direction. After a day or two, everyone gets live footage of the giant moon. According to the studies, the rocket can't be too close to the moon since it may have a stronger gravitational pull. However, the footage shows that tiny particles are floating around it, similar to Saturn's rings. These rings look like a giant disk surrounding the large planet, but up close, they're just particles that are the size of rice grains to the extent of a large bus. They're orbiting Saturn because of the gravitational pull. The images show that these particles are big and small, which doesn't make it safe for the rocket to get any closer. So it suspends itself nearby to orbit the moon and unleashes a mini-rocket that looks like a drone to get closer. The particles are many miles thick, making it difficult for the mini-rocket to maneuver. It flies closer and the particles start crashing on it. It's a good thing that the mini-rocket is durable for this. The rocket finally gets past the particles and lands on the moon. Gravity has gotten stronger since it inflated in size, which almost broke the rocket. As soon as it lands, another robot pulls out and starts driving around the surface, trying to get some clues. As of now, nothing is happening. But they're noticing some quivers coming from deep inside the moon. The moon's core is reacting abnormally. It looks like it's getting bigger and bigger. Scientists don't know if it will stop growing at a certain point, so the only way to find out is to drill a hole deep inside to uncover the reason. You're pedaling away and reach the other side of the mountain. The ground is shaking, and your balance is getting worse. You look across the mountain and see that the whole other side of town is flooded. You get your raft and supplies and make it there. You find a rowboat and paddle as fast as you can until you reach the lighthouse. From there, you can try to find the NASA station. Suddenly, you see a large rocket erupt from the ground and into the sky. You know for a fact that your brother is there, working. But cellular networks are down. You paddle your way there for safety. The little rocket that landed unleashes a small drill strong enough to go miles to the center. It'll take days for it to reach down. So NASA is already launching another rocket to fly off and bring a bigger drill. The only problem is that the moon is getting bigger, so the particles around the moon also gather a lot more. The moon is reaching the Earth's size, getting bigger by the minute. The flood could reach several coastal states, and many micro-islands could be submerged, so it needs to be prevented. Gravity could affect the structure of most of the buildings, causing them to collapse one by one. But the little robot will not let that happen, so he's drilling to figure out what's going on with the moon. Some of the rocks appear to be getting hotter as it digs. This could be a sign of the moon expanding, which might ultimately explode. The scientists in the room are baffled and don't know what to do. The lead scientist, who is your brother, calls you, but he can't reach you. Meanwhile, you're still paddling around, trying to get to NASA. On your way, you head back to the mountains to stay on dry land. 
When you arrive back at the old cabin, you see some strange men wearing trench coats looking for you. There's a stare-off until they chase you. They seem odd, like they're not from Earth. The drill has reached its maximum depth and can't go down any longer. Also, the control transmission is getting weaker. Suddenly, a figure pops out of nowhere and flashes its lights on the robot. The transmission chops and only show little snippets of the giant figure eyeing the robot. A little creature descends from the figure and walks toward the robot. Everyone at NASA is freaking out and recording every single frame. No one can believe what's going on. After a while, the creature transmits a signal that NASA can't decipher. But the creature seems friendly. The creature gets back into its ship and in an instant disappears into thin air as it teleports away. The moon starts shrinking. It's getting back to its normal size. Everyone celebrates in NASA and around the world. The currents become calmer and retreat to the coast. It's a good thing everyone reached the higher hills before. Among all the planets of the solar system, our Earth is unique, since it's the only one that has developed life. But what if we got a competitor? What if a second Earth appeared out of nowhere? Then there would be two different scenarios. The first is the destruction of both planets. And the second has an unexpected but pretty logical ending. But let's start with the catastrophic scenario. The second Earth with the same conditions could only exist if it received absolutely the same amount of sunlight as our planet. The orbit that our Earth follows is perfect for getting the necessary amount of solar heat. If we were a little further away, the entire surface of our planet would resemble Antarctica. And if Earth were a little closer to the sun, we'd all live in a huge desert inhabited by very few living beings. So, for the second Earth to be identical to ours, it would need to follow the orbit of our planet. Two massive objects can exist close to each other. The union of Earth and the Moon is a great example. But if the second object was as heavy and huge as our planet, there wouldn't be enough space for both of them. The gravity of two Earths would be a huge problem. The two worlds would collide because they would be pulled toward each other. This process would last for hundreds of millions of years. And in the end, the two planets would transform into one giant world. And their remnants would be flying around the newly formed planet, resembling the rings around Saturn. Or one of the planets would push the other out of its orbit. In this case, one of the Earths would hurtle toward the Sun and burn like a match in its atmosphere. It's also important to remember that Earth is moving at a speed of 67,000 miles per hour at all times. This is more than 80 times faster than the speed of sound. And now, imagine two huge planets that are flying toward each other at such a speed. Even a microscopic organism living in the mouth of a volcano wouldn't stand a chance to survive the collision of two Earths. Even the moon would be torn to pieces by the blast wave. But let's imagine that Earth's twin is following another orbit, somewhere between Mars and Earth. Even in this situation, people's lives would change forever. By the way, the theory that Earth might have a twin appeared long ago. Scientists of the past believed that the second planet could be hiding on the opposite side of the Sun. Thanks to modern technologies and astronomy, we know this theory isn't true. Otherwise, our telescopes and other equipment would have already caught some signals from this planet. Scientists study space objects thousands of light years away from us, so they would definitely notice another world in the neighborhood. But anyway, let's imagine that the second Earth does exist, and we've discovered it recently. The entire field of astronomy and astrophysics will immediately receive hundreds of billions of dollars in funding. The study of Earth's twin will become a priority goal for people. Experts will put forward hundreds of hypotheses about what the second Earth looks like and what's happening there. The planet is almost at the same distance from the Sun as we are. This means the weather must be the same there. Soon, scientists find out that Earth's doppelganger has liquid water and continents. But they aren't like ours. Their shapes and location are different. Most likely, life exists there too. But what is its origin? There's a hypothesis that life on our planet appeared thanks to amino acids brought here by a meteorite. It's highly improbable that the same thing happened to another world. Life most likely emerged there in a completely different way. 
Perhaps the fish didn't get out of the water on that planet, and the first intelligent creatures appeared in the ocean. These could be amphibians with scales and fins, or octopus-like monsters with huge tentacles. Fish on the second Earth could have come out of the water and grown limbs. But what if they didn't like walking on the ground? Then this world might be inhabited by intelligent bird people. Or life could have originated deep in the soil. Then evolution would create humanoid moles or highly developed worms. To find out for sure, scientists send a rover there. A similar mission to Mars was a success, so there shouldn't be any problems with this one. People on Earth are waiting. What will the rover find on the other side? It will take several years for the ship to get there. Strangely, two days after the launch, it returns. But wait, this is not our space probe. All this time, the inhabitants of the second Earth have been watching our planet too. At one point, they also sent a probe. It's made of the same materials as ours. It has a camera and a recording device. But people are worried because the rover looks similar to a mechanical spider. Can it be that giant tarantulas live in that world? Scientists understand that we need to communicate. We send our guests a radio signal with some information about our civilization. They catch this message and send their own. It contains strange symbols that resemble scratches. Linguists all over the world are trying to decipher it. Meanwhile, astronomers send the guests a recording of human speech. A few days later, our satellites catch a message from our space neighbors with their voices. Scientists are about to play the recording. The whole world is listening with bated breath, and it's a growl. A terrible, an absolutely incomprehensible growl. It has pauses and an unusual rhythm, but it's nothing resembling human speech. The whole planet is panicking. All countries are preparing for an invasion. The most important thing now is to build shields to protect the planet. No one can decrypt the message. It's possible that our neighbors can't understand us either. People make a last attempt to establish some contact. We send a video to explain to our guests with the help of gestures and signs that we only want peace and collaboration. The answer doesn't take long to wait. Our satellite receives their video file. Scientists play back the recording, and it's shocking. We see dinosaurs in robotic suits. Life on the second Earth has been developing in the same way as on our planet, but the infamous colossal meteorite didn't fall there. Over millions of years of evolution, dinosaurs have become sentient. In the video, they're growling and pointing with their claws at the picture of our Earth. Then they start growling even more loudly, and is it laughter? The recording ends. People consider this the announcement of the invasion. Several years have passed. During this time, scientists have exchanged messages with dinosaurs several times, and it seems we're beginning to understand them. It turns out that the reptiles also want peace. They say that their planet was once inhabited by humanoids similar to humans, but a massive flood wiped them away. Dinosaurs managed to survive and evolve into intelligent beings. It will take many years before people set foot on their planet, and when this happens, humanity will feel relieved, realizing that we're not alone. But what if there was no intelligent life on the second Earth? People would also be happy. We would know that we'd always have another home. Perhaps we'd start exploring Earth's twin right away, or begin mining its resources to replenish ours. In any case, our lives wouldn't change immediately because that land would be too far away from our planet. Dozens of generations would pass before people begin settling on the second Earth. Our homeland planet would be losing more and more resources, so everyone would want to move to a new world. In the beginning, only the richest would be able to do it, but with time, space travel would become cheaper. People would probably invest a lot of money to build a paradise on the second Earth. If this happened, we'd be visiting this world during our vacation to breathe fresh air and enjoy nature. In any case. The human population would grow. This means that sooner or later, the second Earth would become as loaded as the first one, and then people would start searching for a new home among the stars. By the way, if any life exists on a planet similar to ours, it's likely to look like octopuses. There's even a theory that octopuses came to Earth from some other world. Any animal has several evolutionary stages of development. For example, 
elephants and mammoths descended from one common ancestor five to six million years ago. Looking even further, almost all mammals evolved from one ancestor they shared with reptiles. Each species has been changing over millions of years. But not octopuses. They suddenly appeared on a family tree. From the point of view of evolution, squids would have to evolve into octopuses millions of years from now. But look, they're already here. Besides, octopuses are incredibly smart. Their genetic code is much more diverse than the human one. They may be visitors from another planet that is similar to ours. But of course, this is only a hypothesis. Ah, Earth. Home. The third blue rock from the sun. The only known planet where life can thrive. We have around 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, and 1% argon, water vapor, and carbon dioxide, give or take. The perfect balance to support our respiration. The troposphere is the lowest and densest part of Earth's atmosphere, 5 to 9 miles thick. It's the part of the atmosphere that keeps changing our weather. For any life to exist, we would need this atmosphere and the same combination of gases to breathe. If all the planets in our solar system were combined to become a mega-Earth, then humans wouldn't have evolved the way we are today, and we'd have a very different planet. If we take the landscape of Mars, we'll only have solid land without large bodies of water. Earth is the only planet in our solar system with bodies of water. One of the first wonders to see will be Olympus Mons, the largest volcano in the solar system. It towers Mount Everest by a long shot at 78,000 feet above the ground. Velus Marineris is a group of canyons that make the Grand Canyon in the U.S. feel like a mm, average one. This wonder stretches for almost 2,500 miles and goes more than 4 miles deep. On top of these epic terrains, there's plenty of other grand-scale locations on Mars that are way bigger than the ones on Earth. The planet might be as large as Jupiter. If the Earth were the size of a grape, then Jupiter would be the size of a basketball. We'd have the size of Jupiter and the rings of Saturn floating around us. The rings may seem like some large chunks of rock in the air, but they're actually ice particles and chunks of iced rocks. They range from the size of pebbles to car-sized ones. Saturn's rings are supported by the unique gravity in the region. With a lot of these ice rocks floating in the sky, there won't be much sunlight entering the planet, which means the planet will always be colder than usual. Not to mention the many moons it has. Our megaplanet could also have many moons circling above us, contributing to the tidal waves. Jupiter is known for the red spot, a place twice the size of Earth that has hurricane-like storms that have been going on for hundreds of years. The people of Mega-Earth will settle far away from it. Mercury is a planet but looks like the moon due to all the craters lying around. That's because of many asteroids and comets striking it over billions of years. But the landscape here mainly consists of mountains, highlands, cliffs, and valleys. The Caloris Basin is almost 1,000 miles wide. They believe it was formed by a comet. The deserts on Earth are mainly hot and consist of dunes of sand, but they also have flat plains and small hills. The largest desert in the world is the whole Antarctic continent. Mercury has no atmosphere to trap any heat, so it gets really hot when the sun is facing it and freezing cold when the planet turns away from it. On this combined mega-Earth, the deserts will most likely have a similar landscape to that of Mercury. The animals living here will probably be something like giant scorpions and desert snakes that soak in some sun during the day and go out hunting at night. But the soaring day temperatures would melt anyone walking. And even though Mercury is the closest planet to the sun, it's not the hottest. Venus has temperatures of nearly 900 degrees Fahrenheit. Scientists believe that the lands here are flat because of the extreme temperatures. But it's not all flat with some volcanoes and highland areas. We can probably find this terrain and climate near the equator since it's always hot there. Humans can't live there unless they build special domes to sustain life. But since the planet is now huge, not all its territory needs to be populated. Some areas will have the proper atmosphere for breathing, but some places might not have such luxuries. Over at the poles, the climate will most likely mimic Pluto's, even though it's not technically a planet anymore. In 2006, they officially declared it a dwarf planet, and it's even smaller than the moon. 
There's not much known about this little mini floating rock, except that it's composed of around 70% rock and 30% ice. Scientists believe that a part of its surface is covered in frozen nitrogen, solid methane, and carbon dioxide. Since the mega planet is huge, gravity might be quite strong here. Jupiter's gravity is enough to double your weight. Humans will most likely be really tall and mega-sized to match the big planet. Even the oceans will be huge. Our oceans will look like little lakes compared to what mega-Earth has in store for us. Humans need something close to 24 hours in a single day. Our bodies adjusted to it quite well. But it wouldn't affect us too much if the day had a few extra hours or a few hours less. We can't live on any other planet without wearing the proper gear. We wouldn't last more than a few seconds in places like Jupiter, Neptune, and Saturn. It's possible to last as long as you can hold your breath on Mars. The atmosphere is thin and the gravity is similar to ours, but you might freeze. Even though it's a red planet, it's actually very cold and has ice caps in the poles covered with carbon dioxide. The same is true for Mercury. You can only last there as long as you can hold your breath and be in the sweet spot between the sunrise and the sunset. Ancient civilizations wouldn't have been as diverse as they were on Earth, since the extreme terrains and conditions wouldn't have allowed for discovery and training. But eventually, as humans develop special technologies for certain areas, different cultures would emerge. Many animals would also evolve in specific and unique ways. But because of the planet's enormous size, isolation, and being on top of the food chain would let certain animals be around since the beginning of the planet without evolving. So it's possible that this mega-Earth might have ancient dinosaurs roaming around, and they'd be even bigger than the ones on Earth. And even though there's a high chance that some humans might be physically different than each other, there might even be more than one species of humans living on opposite ends of the planet. Because of the isolation, they evolved in their own ways according to their surroundings. Over the centuries, technological advancements would spread different cultures around and we'd be more open to each other. Neanderthals and Homo sapiens once lived side by side and were considered as the two species of humans. Neanderthals were intelligent and used tools for hunting and drawing. Homo sapiens were survivors and wandered around to discover new land. There could be two dominant human species and other minor ones that live in certain areas on mega-Earth. They'd be bigger, tougher, and faster than us. The ones who live by the trees would have elongated limbs to stretch out and swing from tree to tree. The ones that live in savannas will probably run really fast and have long legs for that. Countries and cities will be bigger than what we have on regular Earth. A country can be as big as Earth itself. The human population can reach tens of billions. Special transportation technology might be invented for people to travel from one continent to another. Covering those distances can take months or even years if using regular aircraft. High-speed trains that travel so fast over land and rocket-like planes going through the sky. Traveling through oceans will require extremely sturdy ships. Traveling through the Atlantic Ocean is already scary for many, so imagine going on a voyage across a body of water that's potentially eight times the size of Earth. We're gonna need a bigger boat. There'll be areas to avoid, like the Red Spot with its perpetual storms raging on. But the tourist industry might have some room for anyone who wants to see it. Living on such a huge planet is unlikely going to become a reality for most of us anytime soon. But scientists are already discussing moving to other planets to find a new home for humans.